This lecture focuses on plant tissues. What you see in the background of this title slide is the epidermis of a leaf, and we will talk about epidermal tissue in a little bit. Before we start, I will go over an outline of what we'll talk about. The first half of this lecture will focus on simple tissues. These are going to be parenchyma, colenchyma, and sclerenchyma, and we will say what each of those are um, as we go. We will also talk about the food values of each of those. Next, we will talk about complex tissues, and there are three types we will discuss. These are epidermis, as well as phloem and xylem. The latter two both relate to transport. Before we get into the details of different tissue types, let's define tissues and organs. Tissues are groups of cells that together serve a function. Now, in animals, we often say that the cells would have to be of the same type, but we will see with plants that we can have multiple cell types together forming a single tissue. An organ, then, is going to be a plant part that includes multiple tissue types and serves a function, and we'll see an example um, on the next slide. So, for example, leaves are a plant organ, but leaves are composed of three different tissue types. First, on the outside of the leaf, there is epidermal tissue, and this covers, at least initially, all parts of a plant. So that is this layer up here, as well as this layer on the bottom. Additionally, leaves have vascular tissue. This is tissue specialized for transport, and we will see it contains xylem and phloem, and that is pictured in these bundles here and here. Third, leaves contain ground tissue. Ground tissue is composed of simple tissues, which were the parenchyma, colenchyma, and sclerenchyma that we just mentioned. And the ground tissue is where most metabolism occurs within the plant. There's also cells specialized for structural support within the ground tissue. So we've said this. Leaves contain all three of those layers. And leaves, of course, are an organ that are typically specialized for photosynthesis. In a moment, we are going to talk about the different simple tissues. But in order to do so, we first need to review the parts of a plant cell wall. This is going to be because the different tissues are composed of different cell types, and those different cell types are largely differentiated based on their cell walls. So a plant cell wall has three layers. The outermost layer is called the middle lamella. It's called the middle lamella because it's in between two adjacent cells. And it's going to be important mostly for sticking those adjacent cells together. So if you picture another cell above this one, then it would be their middle lamellas that are adhering to one another. The next layer in towards the cytoplasm, shown in sort of peach here, is the primary cell wall. This is composed of cellulose, as well as some other materials, and this confers both structural support as well as protection to the cell. Virtually all plant cells will have a middle lamella and a primary cell wall. The next layer is only present in a few different kinds of plant cells, and this is the secondary cell wall. Um, in most cases, this layer is going to have a lot of lignin in it, and lignin is a strong waterproof compound. So the secondary wall is going to do two things. It's going to confer a lot of extra strength. It is also going to waterproof the cell. Later in the lecture about complex tissues, we will talk about cells specialized for moving water. We'll see that they have a secondary cell wall, and that will be important because it will allow the water to stay within the passageway created in the middle of the cell instead of moving out into the cell walls. So now we can go ahead and talk about the different kinds of tissues. 
the simple tissues are going to include only one cell type. Complex tissues, which we'll talk about later, include more than one cell type. There are three cell types that can each form a simple tissue, and these are the parenchyma, colenchyma, and sclerenchyma that we named back at the start of the lecture. We will talk about each of those cell types now, starting with parenchyma. Parenchyma is characterized by having thin cell walls. Those cell walls are only primary cell walls, not secondary, and the primary cell walls are evenly thickened everywhere. That's important because it will contrast with colenchyma, which we will talk about momentarily. If you look at this picture, this is the cross-section of a stem. So the stem has been cut horizontally to make a circular face. And looking at that, we can see all of these large cells that have thin cell walls in the middle of the stem. Those are parenchyma cells. And you can see that those extend out in this direction um, under where I'm moving my mouse. At the edge of the stem, you can see that there is also colenchyma and sclerenchyma labeled. We haven't talked about their properties yet, but you can see already that they have thicker cell walls. We will specify the difference between them now. Oh, before we do, let's talk about the function of parenchyma cells. So parenchyma does a few different things. First, it is the most metabolically active cell type of the three. It is where photosynthesis occurs. It is where most respiration occurs. It is where most substances are synthesized. It is also used for storage. Some examples of things that could be stored in parenchyma include starch, water, oils, and pigments. Meristematic cells are also initially parenchyma. Remember that meristematic cells are the cells that divide and then expand to create um, the cells that make up the plant's body. So those cells, because they need to be able to expand, they can't have already thickened cell walls. That means they need to start as parenchyma, which has thin cell walls. Some of them may later differentiate into the other two types. We'll move on now to talk about colenchyma. Colenchyma, like parenchyma, only has primary cell walls. So that's a similarity, but the difference is that the cell walls of colenchyma are unevenly thickened. This can be true in different places, but most commonly it occurs at the corners of the cells. Let's take a look at the picture here. On the far right of the picture, you see some large cells with thin cell walls. These are labeled as parenchyma. If you look further to the left, getting out closer to the edge of the stem, you see that the cells are a little bit smaller, and they have these very thick, dark areas between them. Those dark areas are the cell walls, you can see that they are irregularly thick because they are only very thick at the corners. In the areas where the two cells almost touch, then the, second, the cell wall is fairly thin. So those cells are colenchyma. Colenchyma is important for providing flexible strength and protection in regions where the tissue is still elongating. We will talk about sclerenchyma next and we will see that sclerenchyma has a substance in it called lignin that is not good at elongating. It is very resistant to that. That means that in tissues that still need to lengthen, colenchyma can provide the support and lengthening can still occur. Not surprisingly then, we find colenchyma in regions that need support even as they elongate. Some examples of places where we'd find colenchyma, and we can find colenchyma tissue as groups of colenchyma cells altogether. We could find this colenchyma tissue in the stems of herbaceous plants, as well as in the pedials of leaves and leaf veins, because both pedials and leaf veins need to provide structural support to the leaf. Celery is the poster child for colenchyma, You've probably eaten the celery stem, and you've noticed the 
uh, wiry bundles of fibers in those stems, each one of those bundles is a collection of collenchyma tissue. Let's move on to sclerenchyma. Sclerenchyma has, unlike colenchyma and parenchyma, it has thick secondary cell walls. We'll start by looking at the picture here. Each one of these cells that has its walls stained red is sclerenchyma. You can see the brighter red is the primary cell wall, but then the thick area of darker red is the secondary cell wall within that. Cell walls in sclerenchyma are typically thickened with lignin. Lignin is a waterproof substance that is also very strong and resistant to compression. This is going to confer substantial physical strength on tissues with sclerenchyma. It's also important that sclerenchyma can return to its original shape when it is compressed. So think about a tree branch blowing in the wind. It might get moved around, but after the wind burst stops, that branch is going to return to its original position, and sclerenchyma is largely what allows it to do so. The fact that lignin is waterproof is going to be important because we're going to see that a very similar kind of cell forms vasculature, and this is going to allow those cells to allow water to pass through and not enter the cell wall as that water goes through the cells. There's a problem with sclerenchyma cells. They have these thick secondary cell walls. That's great for strength, but it also makes it very hard to transport materials from cell to cell. Transporting materials is important for allowing um, cells to survive and to develop because a developing cell needs to acquire materials. It will also have waste products to get rid of. So it needs some way of doing this. And what we see in this picture, this is a picture of a related cell type, you can see that there are pits or openings between the cells that are going to connect and allow movement from cell to cell. So that will allow the cells to get the materials they need to grow and survive. Eventually, many sclerenchyma cells are going to die. That's because the primary purpose of the sclerenchyma cells is structural support. And for structural support, it doesn't really matter whether there's living material inside the cell. What mostly matters is that the secondary cell walls are present. We will contrast two different kinds of sclerenchyma. The first is fibers. Fibers are long, thin cells that serve a structural or protective role. We typically find them along the stems, the edges of stems, or along the vascular tissue, which we will talk about is the tissue that conducts um, water and other fluids in stems. We will also find fibers at the edges of leaves, or along the vasculature in leaves. And we can have a bundle of uh, sclerenchyma cells that together form um, a very tough fibrous material, as shown in this picture here. All of these cells are sclerenchyma. These cells we're looking at in cross-section, but if we were to turn them the other way and look at them along their length, these would likely be one or a few centimeters long. We'll contrast that with sclerids, and the sclerid is pictured here. The difference is that sclerids are round or irregular in shape, but they are not very elongate like fibers are. Sclerids serve mostly a protective role. They occur in places like the pits of stone fruit, so in cherries or peaches, for example. They also occur in the shells of nuts, and they occur in the coats of seeds. In all cases, they're protecting the material inside from herbivores or being crushed, um, for example. We've now talked about the 
makeup and function of parenchyma, colenchyma, and sclerenchyma. I would like to here talk a little bit about how each of these is used in human and animal nutrition. So of these three cell types, parenchyma is by far the most important. That's because plants use parenchyma for storage, so most of the nutrients then are in parenchyma cells. That means animals are going to be primarily interested in eating parenchyma in order to, direct, to acquire those nutrients. Now, mammals are unable to digest cellulose. Remember that cell walls are made more out of cellulose than anything else. I say they, mammals cannot digest cellulose without help because some mammals have microbes in their guts that are able to digest the cellulose, and so the two work together to accomplish it. However, humans cannot do this trick. So for humans, cellulose is indigestible. This is important with regard to colenchyma because remember that colenchyma has thick primary cell walls. That means it has substantial amounts of cellulose. For humans, that means colenchyma is not a great source of nutrition. Colenchyma that we eat is pretty much going to pass through our digestive system without being substantially affected. This is similarly true of lignin. Mammals and virtually all other animals cannot digest lignin. Remember that sclerenchyma is typically lignified. That's usually the substance that thickens the secondary cell walls. That means that sclerenchyma is also going to pass through a human's digestive tract without um, being a substantial source of nutrition. Then what is the food value of simple tissues? Parenchyma is highly valuable as a source of sugars, starch, fat, proteins, and other substances. Colenchyma and sclerenchyma, in contrast, are primarily contributing dietary fiber. Now this gets confusing because we've already defined fiber as elongate sclerenchyma cells. Here we're using the term fiber though in a dietary sense, not in a botanical sense. So to a dietitian, fiber simply refers to indigestible plant material. That would include true fibers in the botanical sense, but it would also include colenchyma and sclerids. So why is it useful for humans to consume fiber if we cannot derive nutrition from it? Kellogg's over here reminds us that we eat fiber because it helps us get happy inside. And uh, what do they mean by that? Well, as this poster on the left reminds us, constipation, it brings out the worst in all of us. In other words, when we eat food, we have a dietary interest in it passing through our gut in a reasonable amount of time. Fiber helps with this for a couple of reasons. It stimulates the intestinal tract. It helps attract water into the intestines that then creates a looser bowel. And as a result, fiber increases our digestive regularity. There, besides not being constipated, there can also be other health benefits that come from eating fiber, so nutritionists would encourage us to include fiber, um, plant fiber, in our diets. Some final thoughts from this first part of the lecture that focused mostly on the simple tissues. Among the three simple tissues, colenchyma and sclerenchyma primarily serve a structural role and it's parenchyma that accomplishes almost everything interesting the plant actually does. Another thought, between colenchyma and sclerenchyma, those are the two structural materials, whether colenchyma gets used or sclerenchyma is going to largely depend on whether that tissue still needs the potential to expand. If it has the potential to continue expanding, then the plant will use colenchyma if that tissue is fully elongated and now just needs extra support or protection, then sclerenchyma could be a better choice. Finally, I want to emphasize that parenchyma, colenchyma, and sclerenchyma all can contribute to ground tissue.
when we say that organs contain ground tissue, really what we're saying is that all organs have at least some parenchyma, cholenchyma, or sclerenchyma.